So today we're going to talk a bit about relativity, but what I want to do is I want to take a few steps back and do a bit of a reality check on relativity, the ideas, the concepts surrounding relativity, because it seems to me after doing the research that I've done and watching YouTube videos and reading people's papers and listening to the opinions of um, my YouTube subscribers, it seems to me like everyone seems to have a different idea of what relativity is and we're definitely not all on the same page and so today I want to take a few steps back and and see if I can sift through all of these different ideas to come up with a um, to put us all on the same page so that we're all on the same page when we're talking about relativity so I was watching a couple of videos from this guy physics problems and solutions and um, I like the way he talks I like the way he presents things and I think he might be able to help us clear things up so let's have a look at this video and then um, I will stop it when um, when I want to make a comment about what he's saying and let's see if we can figure out what's going on here so this video is called is length contraction real now there are a lot of people out there that think that like length contraction is real and I've had conversations and maybe arguments with people about this on my YouTube channel. And so let's have a look and see what this guy has to say. In special relativity, there is this phenomenon called length contraction. It says that the measured length of an object depends on the relative velocity of the object and the observer. But this is really awkward and difficult thing to accept because how can a solid object shrink just because we are moving relative to it. Is it really true that the solid object can shrink due to relativity or it is just an illusion? The first option is suspicious though because there is just simply no way a distant observer could change the size of an object just by changing its relative motion. So, okay, so, so what is really going, so is on, really here? going on When we here? say... Okay, so that is the question. So obviously... If I am in relative motion next to the rock, there is no way that my relative motion relative to the rock is going to length contract the rock. Okay, so let's see what he has to say about all that. A special relativity, it can spark a wrong idea that we now have more relative quantities than we had before in classical physics. But this is not true. Special relativity just means that some quantities that we thought to be absolute are now relative and some quantities that we thought to be relative are now absolute. One of such quantities is speed through space-time. In classical physics it is a relative quantity but in special relativity it is an absolute quantity. So the special relativity is just a trade-off between relative and absolute quantities. And one important thing that become relative in special relativity is simultaneity. This basically means that if one observer experiences two spatially separated events at the same time, this won't be true for an observer that is moving relative to these events. And this is the crucial ingredient to understand the length contraction, because relative simultaneity breaks the very definition of quantity called the length. So basically what he's saying here is that simultaneity or the problem of simultaneity is the key to understanding relativity and in particular uh, length contraction. Okay. And so, um, and the problem of simultaneity is uh, because there is a finite speed of light. So even though the speed of light is um, the same for each observer, there's a problem when there's an inter-observer observation. So when uh, so one observer will see one thing and another observer will see another thing because of the finite speed of light. So what is actually quantity called length? Imagine there is you and an object you want to measure the length of. If you have a ruler, you can establish your coordinate system so you know the distance from you to every point in the universe. Now you take the distance of one end of the object and subtract the distance of the other end and the absolute value of this difference is the length of the object, right? So the definition of length is easy. You just take the positions of 
both ends of the object and subtract them. But is this definition really good enough, because what if the object was moving? If it's moving and you take the position of one end and then the other, you might find out that the length is higher or lower depending on the ordering in which you measure the positions of both ends of the object. Therefore, if you want a good definition of length, then you have to specify the time at which you measure the two positions. And of course, the only possible way to do this consistently is if you measure it at the same time. In this way, it doesn't matter whether the object is moving or not, you will always measure the same length. Therefore, the length is a good quantity since it doesn't depend on the observer, so everybody in the universe would measure the same value. This definition though is only good if you have an absolute simultaneity. But this is where our definition breaks when we jump into special relativity, because in special relativity there is no such thing as absolute simultaneity. To give you some practical example, Imagine you have a ship and you are at rest relative to this ship and you measure its length to be 5 meters. Now imagine an observer moving relative to this ship and he wants to measure the length of the ship. So he measures the positions of front and back end of the ship simultaneously and subtract them. He finds out that the ship is just 4 meters long. But how so? This is however no surprise for the observer that is in the ship's rest frame, since in his frame of reference the moving observer measured the front end of the ship first and then the back end of the ship later. So another way of saying that that maybe makes more sense is when this observer measures the uh, back end of the ship, okay, so the distance from the back end to the ship uh, is a little bit shorter than the distance to the front end of the ship. Okay, so this guy is going to see the back end of the ship. So when they take the measurement, they're going to see the back end of the ship uh, at a certain time, and they're going to see the front end of the ship as it was a little bit previously. Okay, so they're going to see the light that come from the front end of the ship when he measures simultaneously when he takes a measurement at the same time, he's going to see the back end of the ship uh, at a certain time and he's going to see the front end of the ship uh, a little bit earlier because it's going to take a little longer for the light to get from here to here and so the, the light from the previous, uh, previous timestamp is going to get to him at the same time as the back of the ship and they are going to make a shorter measurement. So that is the kind of true meaning behind the length contraction. There is nothing really physically contracting. It's just that it takes the light uh, from the back end of the ship to reach the person. Uh, it reaches it sooner than from the front because this is further away. And so the light that they get simultaneously is going to be the light um, from when the ship was, say, over here. So if the object is moving relative to you, you have a different simultaneity plane than the observer in the object's rest frame. And therefore there is no wonder you are going to disagree on the result because you are comparing different things. So the problem of length contraction is not that solid objects shrink just because someone is moving, but it is because the quantity called the length is no longer a well-defined quantity in special relativity. And that is the whole story, so there is not any mystical force acting on the object just because someone is moving. If you want to define a quantity called the length in special relativity, then you have to also specify in which frame of reference it should be measured. And this is why we have the quantity called proper length, and it is simply the length of the object in its rest frame. After all, you don't have to worry that you are losing information about the world around you just because you can't measure the length of the object directly. All you have to do to get the proper length is to multiply it by the gamma factor, which depends on the velocity. So basically what he's saying here is that this um, transformation, this is a transformation, it's called the Lorentz transformation, um, this value here, gamma, is the transformation okay, from the moving coordinate system 
to the uh, rest frame of the moving object. Okay, so you are getting the measurement when you make this transformation, then you're getting the measurement that you would measure in the proper rest frame of the moving object itself. So I think the main take home here is that the length contraction from relativity is not a physical length contraction. Um, there's no way that this uh, observer here that is in motion is length contracting the rock and, uh, and or vice versa. If the rock is the observer, then the rock is going to observe a length contraction of this guy here but it is not a physical length contraction. The length contraction has to do with the problem of simultaneity, measuring something simultaneously uh, while something is in motion, as I showed you earlier. Okay, so, um, you know, relativity, the length contraction of relativity is not a physical length contraction. I think that's the most important point that I can make uh, in this video. So there is one more thing I want to talk about uh, in this video to in preparation for the future videos that I'm going to make about this subject. Okay, so, and it has to do with Newton's, Newton's laws of motion. Okay, so, uh, and inertial frames, the concept of inertial frames. Okay, so um, the generalized Newton's laws, law of motion is an object in motion remains in motion unless acted upon by an external force. And this motion, okay, this, the, this motion is a constant motion and not a, um, an accelerated motion necessarily. Okay, so with one exception. So there are actually two, I added two um, caveats to this law. Okay, so um, an object in stillness remains in stillness unless acted upon by an external force. Now, I think it's important to state this one as well. So an object in stillness remains in stillness unless acted upon by an external force. An object in motion remains in motion. We're talking constant velocity, linear velocity, unless acted upon by an external force. And I add one more, an object in orbit remains in orbit unless acted upon by an external force, okay? So this is kind of an important one, and this is one that is left out, and maybe this is the one, this one is actually kind of misunderstood, okay? An object in orbit, like the Earth around uh, orbiting or, um, the sun, so these are all inertial frames, and so an object in stillness obviously is an inertial frame. An object moving linearly in constant motion is obviously an inertial frame but an object in orbit is also an inertial frame because an object that's in orbit, gravitationally in orbit around another gravitational object remains in orbit unless it gets knocked out of its orbit, okay? So this is not the same as an object spinning. So there's an experiment called the uh, Sagnac experiment, I think that's how it's said, which is a Michelson-Morley type experiment that um, is spinning. Okay, this is a spinning um, experiment. And so it's got mirrors and detectors, just like in the Michelson-Morley experiment. So here is a schematic of that experiment. Okay, this experiment is rotating. It's on a rotating disc. And this is not an inertial frame. Okay, so a lot of people point to this experiment and claim that it goes against relativity because it shows the uh, fringe effect um, and therefore there's an ether, okay? I, I'm not denying the ether at all. Um, I think that the earth is at rest with respect to the ether and that's why the Michelson-Morley experiment um, gets a null result. But uh, this is not an inertial frame, okay? This is not an inertial frame and therefore you cannot compare this experiment to the Michelson-Morley experiment, which I believe is at rest with respect to the ether. I believe the Earth is at rest with respect to the ether. Um, any uh, object that's naturally in orbit in the universe is at rest with respect to the ether. And this is possibly because either ether drags, Earth drags the ether, or ether um, drags the Earth. I think it's more likely that ether, uh, there are ether vortices 
in the universe and that um, these ether vortices are moving the earth just an idea i don't have any proof of this obviously but uh, the main point i want to make here is that this uh, sagnac experiment and i don't know if i'm saying this correctly let's see the sagnac experiment um, is not an inertial frame and therefore it cannot you cannot not apply relativity the relativistic effects to um, to this spinning object because it, it is not um, an inertial frame okay and so uh, let's get back to this here so uh, newton's laws of motion actually there's three of them in my opinion an object in stillness remains in stillness unless acted upon by an external force an object in motion remains in motion unless acted upon by an external force and an object in orbit remains in orbit unless acted upon by um, an external force and so this one here i think it's it's important to realize that an object in or in orbit in a natural orbit in uh is also an inertial frame okay so that's all I'm going to say today on relativity. I do want to get into the time dilation slash clock retardation and actually the length contraction and clock retardation actually go kind of hand in hand. It's like you can't have one without the other. And so uh, we'll talk about that in the next video.